Uh, so we've come to the end of the program, and uh, last but certainly not least is uh, John Dick. John is currently senior scientist at the o Ontario Cancer Institute. He's also professor of medicine, a professor of molecular genetics at the University of Toronto, and is the director of the, uh, the program's cancer stem cells at the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. Uh, John is very well known in this field um, for his work on normal hematopoietic development and the development of leukemias. Uh, early on, he was able to do transplantation experiments with normal hematopoietic progenitors, as well as leukemic cells into immunodeficient animals. And it was based on that work that he and then later others um, began to focus on subsets of leukemic cells with properties of stem cells. Uh, and this really formed the basis of the current cancer stem cell uh, model. And John has contributed significantly to that model. And he'll describe some of that work today. Um, he'll be, he's been recognized by uh, too many awards to list. I'll just name two, the American Association for Cancer Research Clues Award and the Diamond Jubilee Award from the National Cancer Institute of Canada. And John's title is Stem Cells in Cancer, Do They Matter? Okay. <clears throat> Well, I guess my, my challenge is to uh, keep you in your seats uh, until the uh, the end of the uh, until the end of the symposium, which has been a, a great, uh, really a great day. So, what I want to do today is to uh, really tell you about a work in progress uh, to a large extent, uh, and but I'll, I'll frame it in the context of work that uh, that's been ongoing in my lab for a period of time. Uh, so, the first part I'll talk about this sort of uh, provocative talk, topic that uh, about leukemia stem cells, whether they're relevant and real. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, new directions in terms of what controls stemness uh, in both normal and leukemia stem cells. And if I have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about sort of philosophy, about whether or not we can uh, bring together what many people had, had thought of and had sort of argued in the literature were two sort of mutually exclusive views of heterogeneity and cancer. Uh, and so we'll, we'll try to get to that. So um, I, I think that you know, we've, there, there's a lot of emphasis uh, in recent years about the idea of uh, heterogeneity in tumors. And I guess the way I would say it is the most important heterogeneity uh, relies around or revolves around the question of does every cell in a cancer have equal potential or equal probability of keeping the clone going, of keeping the cancer going? So that's the heterogeneity that, that we've been most interested in. And the answer, of course, has ended up being fairly controversial. And you know, there's nothing like a good controversy to stimulate good science. And so I think that, that that's been a good thing, that cancer stem cells are controversial. But I guess I would say that, at least in the context of AML, I think there's very strong evidence to say that, in fact, the answer to that question is no, that there are some cells that are more potent at keeping the clone going uh, than uh, the rest of the cells of the clone. And they, it turns out they happen to be really quite rare. Um, and so uh, the idea, not only that there is rare cells that do that, but that they actually seem to uh, rep you know, be represented as a class of cells. Uh, so there's a population of cells that actually have that potency, uh, and they make the rest of the cells of the clone. Now, they have the key property that they make themselves. So they bear the canonical properties of stem cells. They can make cells not like themselves, but they can renew themselves. And so those are the key canonical properties that define this. And that's why we would call it a cancer stem cell. But I tend to favor, actually, an operational term, uh, a cancer-initiating cell, or a, in our case, a leukemia-initiating cell. And so I'll just kind of reversibly go back and forth across those kind of ideas. So why do we know more about that uh, in leukemia? Or why is the evidence the strongest in leukemia? Well, I think one of the reasons is that we've been able to traverse this divide. And so to understand not just the fact that there could be a hierarchy, but really to understand the assays and to, and to have the tools available to try to actually infer that there is such a thing as a hierarchy has really been built on 50 years of research uh, at defining normal hemopoiesis, first in the mouse and actually through the work of two uh, really talented grad students in my lab who took on this challenge uh, a couple of years ago, Sergei Dulatov and Fayez Nota, uh, we now have really for the first time uh, a really deep understanding of the early events of human hemopoiesis at a clonal level. So why has that been important? Well, what we have in understanding normal development are you know, 300 odd CD markers, which give you almost infinite uh, uh, sets of tools that give you an infinite sort of view of, of the developmental pathway uh, in normal hemopoiesis. 
ways of sorting these cells. You can bin them based on marker expression into various bins that we'll call these various uh, uh, labels here. And then the key thing is we have functional assays. Uh, that will define whether a cell can repopulate the whole blood system or whether it has restricted lineage specification, such as this uh, erythroid megakaryocytic progenitor. But the key really is, and the reason we can have this diagram and have these arrows be meaningful, is the, uh, the, the, the use of uh, clonal assays. And so those tools that have had this longstanding... Um, uh, or, uh, they've been longstanding in the community are critical to understand, both to develop assays appropriately, but also how to interpret assays uh, when one wants to infer uh, this. And I think that, in fact, it's, it's, the, it's the absence of having this kind of knowledge and being able to diverse in most other solid tumors, which actually has really held back and really contributed to the controversy of uh, uh, tumor-initiating cells or the idea of a cancer stem cell beyond uh, AML. And, and I'll just sort of make this point, because I think it's really an important one. You know, what we hope for are a series of markers which will align with particular function, and in this case, multipotentiality. And so what we want are populations of cells that are marker pure, and it can be, you know, five, six, seven. And to get that list I just showed you requires uh, about 13 color uh, analysis to actually get some of those populations. And what we expect is they're marker pure and they're functionally pure. So if I have a population of cells, I port them in my assay, all the cells will give, in this case, a, a multi-lineage readout, self-renewal if it happened to be a stem cell, and the like. But the problem is we could have a situation where cells are marker pure, but they're functionally heterogeneous. So if I take multiple cells, I can get exactly the same output, but you know, that outcome is coming from that cell, that's from that cell, and that from that cell. You can't distinguish this in a standard assay. You have to have colony assays or clonal assays. And that really is fundamental, I think, to uh, moving forward. And is, it, we've been tried to We've been trying to be guided by this principle as we studied leukemia. Okay, so that's my standing on a pulpit and, uh, and beating it for a moment. But really, if this is true, so if one accepts the idea that you know, our, our, our xenograft assays are not just giving a figment of, of imagination, um, the question is, is this leukemia stem cell real or not? And if it's real, is it relevant? You know, there's many things that we do in most models that aren't relevant in the human situation. Most are, but sometimes they're not. And so how do we test both of those things? And so I think the thought process is, well, if this is the only cell that's able to maintain long-term clonal growth, it stands to reason that this represents the unit of selection for that tumor. And if that's the case, then, it's the properties of these cells rather than the rest of the clone that ultimately should be prognostic or that should um, uh, uh, govern how that patient's going to do, because it's the only cell that's able to maintain long-term clonal growth. And so then, the, question, then the, the point is, if that's true, then the properties of that cell should be more prognostic uh, at predicting patient survival than just simply sampling the whole tumor. And that becomes a testable hypothesis. Difficult to test, but testable nonetheless. And so this is a project that Coley Eppert and the lab took up, and we've just recently reported. So I'm just going to touch on the highlights of this, because we've, we've published this. So he's done his work on 16 primary samples. Within three weeks, this number, after three years of hard work by a group of people, will end up being 100 primary AML samples. Where we've tested with this algorithm, we fractionate into four fractions. We test each of the fractions by transplantation in mice and ask functionally, where are the LSCs? And that becomes important. I'll raise that in a second. So we now have an LSC-specific signature by just comparing where the LSCs are and where they're not. And then we can ask, are they actually clinically relevant to test the hypothesis that I raised? This is, what, this is where the problem lies. You can only test stem cells by function. You're limited to not transplanting to humans, but you do it in xenograft models. And the problem is that there is the xenograft model that we used originally to define the idea that there was such a thing as an AML stem cell has changed a lot over the last 25 years. Uh, and in fact, the assay system as, it, as it's been developed even three years ago uh, is, is very different up until three years ago, was very different than it was in the previous 20. And so the point being, the assay governs what you see. And so the question was, in our original study, we had found that the leukemia stem cells were only in this fraction. And so the easy thing would have been to just simply sort these fractions, collect them, and do this without testing them in vivo. But this is where the problem lies. So this is just looking at not 100, but 50-odd samples. And you can see that, satisfyingly, in the 53 samples, we always saw leukemia stem cell activity in this so-called 34 positive, 38 negative fraction. That's nice. That's where we said that they should be. But with this improved assay system, we saw that it's only there in about you know, 30% of the time, only in a single fraction. 
Usually it's present in this fraction and this fraction, which represents an, about you know, almost a half or 40% of the samples. And occasionally we see samples where we actually see activity in all four fractions. And so you can say, well, you know, that says that that leukemia isn't a hierarchy. Alternatively, I could say, well, maybe just 34 and 38 are lousy markers and they don't affiliate uh, with uh, uh, stem cell function. Um, you know, sets of markers which work very well in normal development may not work well in cancer because in the end, these are just differentiation antigens that we use for sorting. And of course, cancer screws up differentiation. So you, maybe you wouldn't expect that you have marker sets which would be universal uh, across all spectrum. But if you have functional assays, you can actually ask, well, where the leukemia stem cells are. And so in the end, that's what we did. We saw signatures of genes that were more highly expressed compared to uh, the lowly expressed cells. We developed a signature which was specific to the engrafting fraction compared to the non-engrafting fraction. Um, and then we asked, well, what do they look like? And so Scott just finished telling you that in one form of a mouse model of uh, leukemia, the cells were very reflective of progenitors. And since we've done very similar kinds of um, gene expression on normal stem and progenitor cells, we did simple gene set enrichment and asked, what do our leukemia stem cells look like? And it turns out they don't look like stem cells, they look, or they don't look like progenitor cells. And so uh, that seemed to be a difference. And so we had also done uh, normal HSCs. And you can see with gene set enrichment that there's actually very strong enrichment between our AML LSC signature and a normal HSC signature. And in fact, they share a very large number of genes. And it appears then that the AML stem cells have shared determinants of stemness uh, between normal and, 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 uh, and leukemia um, uh, LSCs. And so then we went, we now have a, a leukemia stem cell signature. We knew something about it. We knew something about the genes that they share with normal. And we think that these are core determinants of stemness. And so the question was, uh, are these prognostic? Can we test the hypothesis that we raised in the, in the first slide? And so uh, data has been generated where gene expression has been collected on patients. Uh, and, uh, uh, and survival has been collected on these patients, a whole number of clinical uh, variables, incl including survival. And so we simply asked, well, in this set, in this case, 160 samples, is our, is our leukemia stem cell signature equally expressed across this 160 patients? And the answer is no, it's not. Some patients express it highly, some patients express it lowly. And so if you basically say, well, all right, so it's expressed variably, is the survival different between those that have high signature and those that have a low? And so we just simply drew a median and asked, is there a difference in survival? And the answer was that there's a marked difference in survival. So the statisticians love this. You know, there's six zeros in front of the p-value. Um, if you have a high signature, you do much more poorly than if you have a low signature. Now, that's for the LSC signature. Now, it turns out that HSCs also drive uh, similar, one less zero in the p-value. But nevertheless, if you have a high uh, normal HSC signature, you also do poorly. And in fact, it's this common shared signature which actually drives uh, this. So it's not a leukemia stem cell specific signature per se. It's actually the stemness nature uh, of these genes that actually seem to drive this outcome. We've done this now in, in uh, four independent clinical data sets uh, where this uh, actually holds up. And so it appears then that at least we can say that our original hypothesis that if an LSC is important, it should be the most, um, uh, uh, its property should be the most predictive of patient survival. And it appears that that seems to be the case. The question is, is this useful for anything? So in AML, uh, you can guide therapy based on translocations. The problem is that in 40% of patients, they're cytogenically normal. And so it's very difficult to uh, stratify therapy to those patients because it's an intermediate risk category. Uh, some patients do poorly, and some patients do reasonably well. And so people have used mutational status uh, in order to work this out. And uh, at currently, clinically, you can stratify patients based on low molecular risk or high molecular risk based on various uh, features of these genes. Uh, and typically, if you're high risk, your, your only hope is allogenic transplantation. It has a very high morbidity. You only give it to patients who most need it. Um, but the problem is that quite a few patients who don't get transplant and are just given therapy actually will go on to relapse. And so the question is, which of the patients here should be actually offered that therapy because they actually are at high risk, this isn't appear, doesn't appear to be a good uh, stratifier. And so we subsetted our data. And this is a relatively low number of patients. And we will need to do more work to prove this. But if you just focus on the arrows, this is the low molecular risk patient. So we asked, is there a difference in the signature? And it turns out you could pick up a few patients that have a high signature, a few that have a low signature. And you can see that the survival outcome is extremely different 
Those that have a low signature for AML actually do very well. And if you have a high signature, even though you're low molecular risk, you actually do very poorly. And so if this bears out in future trials, aside from new drugs, just simply offering patients like this transplantation uh, is, is it would be a clinical trial to, to use this to test whether this is actually a relevant uh, signature. So it may be a way to actually guide therapy just based on stemness uh, properties. So, so that's kind of where we are with um, saying that yes, leukemia stem cells must be real because if they can predict survival this way, and they must be relevant uh, if we can perhaps begin to use this to guide therapy. And so uh, the other thing is, is this just relevant to AML? Now, we have, as I told you, have a more refined view of uh, human empoiesis because of the, the work of, of, uh, of uh, Sergey and Fayez. Uh, and uh, we now have uh, uh, very high quality signatures of each of these populations of cells. So uh, about a year or so ago, uh, we've been doing other work with Charles Mulligan, and Charles had been working on TALL. And what they had noted was that there was a subtype of TALL that had a phenotype and other properties called, th that reflected what had appeared to be the, uh, the early T cell precursor, which is a, a subset of a, of a normal development of a cell, uh, which here is supposed to go on to the thymus, or is in the thymus and, and makes T cells. Uh, those patients tend to have a very poor uh, outcome compared to the rest of TALL. And while they were sequencing these patients, they noted that the ETP form of TALL had a completely different spectrum of mutations compared to the usual form of TALL. And, what they, uh, what, and the mutational spectrum uh, was in genes that were involved in myeloid development, in stem cell function, RUNX1, run and, and the like. And, uh, and so he had gene expression signatures on the ETP form of that. And so we looked and mapped by gene expression array his signature against the 10 subsets that I showed you. And what was interesting was when we compared his ETP form against normal ETP, there was no enrichment. Uh, and so the, the ETP TLL is a misnomer. It certainly doesn't look like normal ETP. What it looks like, nice enrichment for uh, a GMP signature, nice enrichment for a stemness signature, and in fact, there's even an enrichment against our AML LSC signature. And so it appears then that this, this ETP, as predicted by the mutational analysis, represents some kind of a primitive uh, uh, kind of a cell that uh, uh, obviously would warrant different kinds of therapy than the typical therapy you would give a normal TLL. But the point being then that these signatures of stemness actually uh, are not just restricted and perhaps not even, not just important in AML, but they may be important in other kinds of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of leukemia, perhaps because what they're pointing to are the determinants of stemness. So I think I, I said everything that's going to be in that slide. And so while we were doing this work, we were also looking at uh, other determinants of, of uh, what could be potentially regulators of stemness. And we also looked at uh, LSC, or at uh, microRNAs. And so we were looking at microRNAs that were differentially expressed between engrafting and non-engrafting fractions. And there were about 10 microRNAs that were more highly expressed in the engrafting fraction than the non-engrafting fraction. And the one we focused on initially was MER-126. Uh, when we looked in normal development, it turns out that not only is it expressed between LSCs uh, compared to non-LSCs, but it turns out to be more highly expressed in the stem cell fraction compared to the progenitor fractions. Now, we struck up a collaboration with Luigi Naldini, and Luigi has made a very nice biosensor lentivirus where you have sort of two colors driven by a bidirection promoter. And one color has, in this case, GFP. You can put targets, in our case of microRNA, uh, downstream of that. And so if you infect a cell and it doesn't have uh, microRNA 126, you'll have equal expression of uh, the two colors. And if 126 is present, you have downregulation of GFP. This is a very busy plot. Uh, all it points to are, is the actual uh, raw data to say that uh, when you look at the level of repression, that is the amount of expression of MER-126, in fact, it's highest in the stem cells and it goes off in the progenitor. So it correlates very nicely with the, uh, with the, array or with the expression by, uh, by PCR, but this is a functionally defined way to look at expression in, in uh, cells. Now, this also is actually a very nice way to control gene expression uh, which is actually the subject of this paper, they have put a, a gene therapy gene that happened to be toxic in stem cells at this location based on this information and could actually silence that gene in stem cells uh, so that they would survive and then they could go on and, and actually get a, a gene therapy uh, uh, correction 
uh, as, the, uh, as the gene came on in mature cells, but that's a sort of a side project. But, but this actually offers the opportunity to sort cells based on this biosensor, and so we did that. We simply took cord blood cells, put them into culture, and after a period of time, we sorted, we infected them with the biosensor, and then we sorted cells based on high and low uh, GFP. And when we sort, transplanted these cells into mice, we showed that all of the activity was always in the uh, MER-126 high fraction, and we had no activity in the low fraction. So not using any cell surface marker, we could actually sort cells uh, just based on this bioactivity of, of 126. Now that becomes an interesting question, because the field has has been stuck in using cell surface markers, whether you're studying normal or cancer stem cells. And, and the, 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 the problem uh, is that what we really need is a functionally determinative stemness. What we need is you know, the OCT4, uh, which is, of course, the canonical marker of embryonic stem cell stemness. We need an OCT4, if you like, a like molecule for adult, uh, in our case, leukemia stem cell or normal stem, uh, uh, function. And so here's, here's how applying the biosensor to this problem in, in, a, in a leukemia in LSCs. So I told you that we had occasional samples where the LSC activity was in all four fractions. And at first blush, you'd say, well, that's not a hierarchical tumor. Here's another case where you had activity in both of those fractions. Here you had it in both of those fractions. So multiple fractions had LSC activity. So we infected these three different patients with this biosensor. I'm not showing you the fax plots. They're a little bit complicated. but with just biosensor alone, we fractionated into four populations, transplanted them into mice. And in every fraction, only one of the fractions of the four was, uh, had repopulating activity uh, in it. And so even this fraction here, where by cell surface markers, we couldn't identify a hierarchy. With this biosensor, where we're selecting just based on the level of 126 expression, we could actually distill this down into a single fraction, uh, which ended up remaking all of the other fractions. So I think that this is the beginning of saying that perhaps these kinds of biosensors, in particular the 126, might actually be a functional uh, way to sort cells based on stemness. And so that raises the question, is 126 an actual functional determinant of stemness? Does it control stemness uh, in normal cord blood. And so Luigi has developed these, again, very nice sort of sponge vectors by adding in more targets to 126 and putting in bulges You can actually, and a very strong promoter, you can actually use this not as a biosensor but as a sponge. And this very effectively knocks down the expression of the micro, microRNA. Now remember, 126 is highest expressed in the stem cell. It goes off with differentiation. So we basically knocked it down, and what we were expecting was to lose stem cell function. In fact, what we got was exactly the opposite. What we saw was an increase. This is human cord blood 12 weeks after transplant with this particular vec knockdown vector. And what you can see is the level of engraftment is higher uh, in the knockdown compared to the control. Now, why is this happening? Well, we did careful cell cycle analysis, and it's a bit hard to see here, but essentially what you can see is in the knockdown group, there's many more cells that are in cycle in G2M, many less cells that are in G0 compared to the control. So it looks like 126 is actually controlling the quiescence of these cells, and when you knock it down, you see an expansion of stem cell function. And when you take these cells and transplant them into secondaries, it turns out that you can actually so, show a marked ex enhancement of stem cell function in these secondaries. And this is a very long time, oh, 28 weeks post-transplant. The numbers are low. We have more experiments on the go, but I think this is definitely uh, solid data. This is one of the first examples that I know of. There are many molecules that can put stem cells into cycle, knocking down P21, P10, and the like. But what this does is it puts stem cells into cycle, and it leads to exhaustion. And we haven't seen exhaustion uh, in this 126 knockdown. Now, conversely, we can do the opposite. We can enforce expression of 126. And what happens now is you can see there's a marked reduction in engraftment. Here is the, sort of the, the, the best sort of time course. Compared to the control, this is a competitive repopulation assay. Compared to the control, there is a, a steady loss. There, there's a bit of a rise and then a steady loss of uh, repopulation in the overexpression group. And what, when we look at cell cycle analysis, what happens is that the, in the stem cell compartment, what we see is an increase in cells that are in G0 uh, in the stem cell group but there's no activity in the progenitor group. In other words, this is a high, even though both of these cells are overexpressing the 126, there's no activity of overexpression in the stem cell compartment, but there's quite specific expression 
in the, in the stem cell compartment, not in the progenitor compartment. So this effect of this change in, in, uh, in cells that are in cycle by overexpression is stem cell specific, as shown right here. Now, it turns out, so in the Nalini lab, they've been doing the mouse equivalent of these experiments. There's, there's a lot of data here, but essentially to say this mimics exactly what we see in the human. If you knock down uh, in a mouse serial transplant, or in a transplant, you wait for you know, almost a year, and then you do a serial transplant, you can see a steady increase in engraftment in the knockdown group. And you can see that's specifically caused by a, an over-contribution of uh, expanded stem cells in the knockdown group. Whereas if you overexpress it, you see a steady loss of contribution of the marked cells. And again, this is due primarily to a specific loss of stem cells uh, compared to other progenitor cells. And so it appears then that MER126 is actually is a stem cell regulator, and it's doing it by regulating quiescence. This is, again, a bit of a work in progress. We're trying to figure out what, of course, with microRNAs, you need to know what the targets are. We've done quite a bit of gene expression array, looking at what are those genes which go down with knockdown or up with overexpression uh, in cord blood cells. And what's interesting, if you look at the, uh, the genes that go up and down, and then you ask how many of those are predicted MER126 targets, uh, there are multiple uh, uh, pa um, uh, processes that are affected. Uh, focal adhesion, uh, receptor integration, migration, localization cells. The top candidate is actually the P85 subunit of um, PI3 kinase. And if you knock it down, you can see an increase uh, of that. And you can see a nice increase in phosphorylation. And what's key here is that, remember, if you knock it down, you see an increase in proliferation. And when you put in the LY compound, which targets the, the P85 uh, subunit of, of this pathway, you can see a, a genetic rescue uh, of that uh, functional property. So this is at least one target uh, of this uh, molecule. But of course, we know microRNAs are targeting multiple, um, multiple events. Now, I'll just leave you uh, with, this, uh, with this notion that uh, 126, we discovered it because it was overexpressed in leukemia stem cells. We did exactly the same experiment. We took primary AML blasts, leukemia cells. We, uh, again, used the same knockdown vector. And this time, what we saw, we saw a heterogeneous response. This is three independent patients. But you can see in the green is the knockdown. And you see in at least two out of the three cases, we see a marked reduction uh, in the engraftment uh, of, these, uh, of these LSCs. So in contrast to the mouse, where we saw, or the normal human, where we saw an increase of normal stem cells, we're seeing a decrease in LSCs. Conversely, if you enforce expression of 126, you see a marked increase in the uh, leukemia stem cell function. These are uh, quantitative LDA assays where we're looking at LSC activity on overexpression. You can see a 20-fold increase if you overexpress 126 in these primary AML patients. And so it appears the same microRNA is having exactly the opposite effect in a leukemia context. And of course, we're quite interested to know what the targets are that are differentially used between normal and AML uh, to explain this uh, different activity. But, but clearly, microRNAs are regulating stemness function in these uh, human uh, stem cells. I'll just simply uh, say that we've looked at the other 10 of these, and we've done this in a, a series of assays where exactly the same way, where we overexpress all 10 of them. And what we're doing is we're asking how many of these give a competitive advantage, how many of them give a loss, and how many of them are neutral. Uh, so if you have, let's say, 20% input gene transfer efficiency, how many of them will give you a competitive increase? And, and the, most, the next hit that came up was actually uh, MER125, which is really shown in the middle here. This is the input value. If you overexpress MER125, you see a much higher level of contribution uh, at 12 weeks and, sorry, at 24 weeks as well, a prominent contribution of MER125. You see a loss in 194. In other words, it looks like all of these other microRNAs are actually functioning at the stem cell level, which I think gives us a rich repertoire of molecules to begin to work on. And potentially, if we could find ways of targeting microRNAs, new potential targets for targeting at the, at the stem cell level. So that was the, the MER-126 story. And, and let me just, I guess I probably have used up my time. I'll just, I'll make one sort of, I'll make two philosophical comments at the end. So Typically, of course, the, the notion uh, that uh, there's heterogeneity in cancer for many decades has relied on the notion that there is genetic heterogeneity in tumors. Cells get hits in the, one of the hallmarks of cancer. That gives a proliferative advantage. Um, we know it's not a linear process like Noel first hypothesized. It's, it's a much more complex 
architecture, the, the, the uh, uh, sequencing data that's come in in the last year and certainly even in the last weeks have told us that uh, if you look inside tumors, there's genetic heterogeneity. If you sample cells at different parts of that tumor, uh, and you can, see, and, and then so you have this sort of progression, multifocal, very complex genetic heterogeneity in tumors, and that that would represent functional heterogeneity. Cells that have many hits should be more tumor initiating compared to cells that have few hits, and that's what that, that would explain heterogeneity. But I think there's a possibility of actually integrating the idea of a, of a cancer hierarchy with the idea of a genetic hierarchy as well. And the idea is that when a tumor is first born from the normal tissue, what it represents in many ways is memory of the tissue from which it came. And so you can imagine that the tumor here, which has relatively fewer genetic hits than the tumor over here, uh, you know, still has some kind of a hierarchy. Uh, where you have some dysregulation, but the stem cells are making non-stem cells. But of course, all these cells are influenced by the genetic changes, including the stem cell compartment, so that over time, you could imagine that as the tumor's initiating cells are sustaining more genetic alterations, you're getting more self-renewal, more stemness function, reduced maturation, and ultimately, the tumor ends up becoming much more homogeneous uh, as the cells are, are, are sustaining a much a deeper genetic burden. And so to integrate these, what you would predict then is that you would have to say, well, you know, the cancer stem cell model is not static. It must evolve. That is, it must change over time. You would imagine, if this is true, that genetic changes should influence leukemia stem cell frequency. So there are gene changes which should increase the frequency of leukemic initiating cells, reduce the uh, amount of differentiation. And, and finally, it would say that there should be genetic diversity uh, that the genetic diversity that is seen in the full tumor should extend into the leukemia stem cell or the leukemia initiating uh, compartment. And if I just sort of go forward to the end, I would just say that um, the most functionally important cell, one of the problems with any kind of static analysis, whether you pick cells by laser microcapture dissection or you sample a tumor here at diagnosis and you find five different genetic clones that are present in those samples, the problem is this is a static analysis. And if you, in this case, if you didn't have the relapse sample, as in the Tim Lay experiment, you wouldn't know which of the five clones was the bad actor, which is the one which is going to be uh, sensitive to therapy and which is the one which is going to survive. Here, a priori, tumors are dynamic entities. If you pick a cell with laser microcapture dissection, you don't know whether that cell is going to live or die the day after tomorrow. Is that cell actually able to functionally sustain long-term clonal growth? And so I think where we need to go is to marry cancer genetics with functional assays. And I would say the only important functional assay is long-term uh, clonal growth. And that's essentially what we've done. I'll just sort of point you to, since I'm at the end of my time, um, point you to this paper that, that we published. It's actually a companion with work from Mel Greaves, where essentially we show that in, B, in BCR able ALL, in fact, there is diversity of leukemic initiating cells, that, that you can find clones that are present at below detectable limit in the patients they happen to have properties which allow them to grow out in xenografts. Uh, and when you look at the property of the clones that grow out in the xenografts, that is, these subclonal variants that are growing out in the xenografts, they actually are related to each other through a very complex architecture um, that's very uh, reflective of the traditional sort of branching evolutionary processes. And so I think that this is a huge challenge for the field of a targeted therapy because we shouldn't be thinking about you know, personalized medicine we should be thinking about personalized clonal medicine. And we need to figure out whether or not the static approaches that we use for finding mutations in patients' tumors are actually capturing all of the clones that are present uh, in these tumors, and whether some latent clones could actually be present, which could then go on, survive therapy, and come back uh, to a later time. So sorry for rushing at the end across that last bit, but I'd used up my time. So thanks very much uh, for your attention. I just uh, indicate that the microRNA work was done by uh, Eric Lechman and, and a student, Peter Van Galen. The LSC was done by Coley Ebert. Thanks very much.